Hi, I'm Cece Washburn um, from Counterfire. I'm really excited to be here with um, Harry Eccles, RCN nurse from NHS Workers Say No. Um, so, um, Harry, you have been at the forefront of the Vote Reject campaign, and we've just today got the result um, of 54% rejects and 61% turnout. Congratulations, that is just an astounding, brilliant, brilliant result. Um, it's a really stunning result, and it's a real expression of the power um, of the rank and file. How, how, how do you and your fellow activists um, and, and fellow workers feel at this time, like, you know, on hearing the result? I mean, it's a mixture of emotions, really. To be honest, none of us would want to be in the situation in the first place. So, you know, we really just hope the government pull their socks up and do what they're supposed to do and resolve it. But at the end of the day, I think, to see nurses on the shop floor, ordinary working NHS workers find their voice to speak up for themselves in the NHS. I find it quite inspiring. And I think the fact that we were fighting uphill because the unions had recommended accept, they've got you know a whole machine behind them and a whole mechanism behind them to push that, push their recommendation forward. Yet the members were able to coordinate themselves, were able to speak for themselves and were able to, to spread the message and ultimately speak up for themselves. So it does really feel like a victory for for working people and hopefully an example for, for trade unionism um, within the NHS, but also in the larger context. So um, yeah, really, really relieved. It's a lot of hard work paid off. And I think it's hard work by full-time NHS workers in their spare time, you know, and I think that's the powerful thing about it. It's, it's real because it's emotive, it means something. We're the ones who are affected by the outcome of this decision. We're the ones who get the final say. And I think it's really powerful that, that that voice has been heard. So yeah, it's been been quite a day, but certainly really relieved um, and also really proud of my my colleagues across the board, really. Fantastic. Yeah, I bet, I bet. And um, you know, so this campaign's going going on for several weeks. And um in, in recent weeks, um yourself and the campaign have been attacked by the press. Um the RCN union didn't defend you at the time or defend kind of its democratic process that the press was interfering with. Um, you know, there was talk of from the RCN of police investigations, um, you know, but it was kind of a real sense of you all being witch hunted um, and a real kind of, um, a real attempt to scupper the campaign. But despite that, you, 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 you won um, a brilliant, brilliant victory. Um, what do you think was key to winning? Um, what what did members like? What was it about the offer that members really wanted to reject? Uh, and what kind of what did the organising look like on the ground? Like, what was the scale of it? Well, a few things. I mean, uh, with regards to the kind of right wing media attempts to kind of smear frontline NHS workers, you know, you've just got to think it's laughable, it's desperate, and it's so separate from what's going on. Um, but I think it was Billy Bragg who said, if the black, if the Daily Mail have a, a blacklist, I want to be on it. So it, I think it shows we're doing something right because they're, they're there to defend the establishment. They're there to defend the power systems that are in place. And we're challenging them that, you know. And I think it is interesting that at the moment, the BMA, which have got a really unified union, it's the leaders of the union that are being attacked. Whereas obviously recently it was it was frontline activists and campaigners rather than union, you know, representatives. So I think that's quite interesting. But why do I think we won? I think we won because we we're on the right side. Um, I think this pay offer, to put it into context, we, we started this campaign asking for inflation plus 5%, which at the minute would be about 15%. And that's actually consistent with what NHS workers they know have been campaigning for for years now, the, the pay 15 campaign. Um, and then to turn around and say, actually, guys, what we're going to give you for this year that you've been on strike for is 0% with a one-off lump sum of 6%, which is still below inflation. Um, and non-consolidated, followed up with a 5% pay increase for the year after when inflation still sits at 10.4%. It's just not, not good. It's further pay cuts. And we're there saying the NHS is not surviving. We're saying we are we are beyond our last leg. We are desperate. We, we cannot keep up this fight alone without reinforcements. And they're saying, well, here's a further pay cut. Let's see if that helps. And of course, it's not going to help. It's not going to fix those issues. So I think that was, that was the clear point. The interesting thing, why did so many members vote to accept, and particularly we've seen this more in unison, is the desperation. I think this was the kind of the divisive nature of the offer, that a nurse or an NHS worker, 
um, from any profession that chose to accept because they've got bills piling up that they just need to pay and they've made that pragmatic decision to go this isn't fair this isn't a good deal but do you know what I've got to put food on my kids table I understand that and I think it's absolutely disgusting that we're even in that situation and even more disgusting that the government will exploit that for their own advantage so I think the reason that we won is because it was clear enough to see and all we did as a campaign group was share information word of mouth on the ground providing the resources to do so that that explained the deal in detail and then trusting members to to use that information and then use their judgment to decide if it's going to be helpful or not and clearly they decided it wasn't so i think for me it's that it's that on we're the ones that are we, we work together on a daily basis we're the ones that can speak to our colleagues on a daily basis and just say hey what do you think about this pay offer and the two responses I got on the ward were, it's awful, I'm going to reject. Or, well, I don't know, I've been told it's quite good and that I should accept it because I've seen the headline, you know, union, unison say vote yes or, or whatever it is. And when you've actually taken the time to go through with them, they've gone, that's really crap. Why, 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 why would we accept that? Or the other thing I heard was, yeah, it's bad, but mate, I need that grand. Um, which I understand, you know, you can't criticise people for that. So um, I think that's the strength that... The strength lies with ordinary working people, with rank and file members of the union, with with frontline workers. Um, and that mean, makes the rhetoric mean something because it's not political. It's not it, it's real. It's, it's coming from our daily experience and it's coming out of um, the emotion and passion that we have for our jobs. So I think that's what did it for us. Brilliant. And, and what did the campaign look like? Because, I mean, you had lots of well-attended meetings I know there were kind of re- loads of re- regional whatsapp groups with, with workers in them you know leafleting at hospitals across the country like can you tell us a bit more about what kind of happened on the ground yeah so I mean NHS workers say now has already got an established network and um, so we've got 90,000 members on Facebook we've got 30,000 followers on Twitter so that's already an established reach that we had um, but obviously the vote reject campaign was supported by NHS workers say no but was much more broader than that and wider than that and encompassed any NHS worker who wanted to fight for a better deal so we had yeah local we had main whatsapp group we had regional whatsapp group set up because that connects people within their hospitals we then provided the literature so the leaflets I spent many an evening sitting here shoving leaflets into envelopes to post out we emailed out hundreds of thousands that people self-printed and then people connected so you'd see people on the whatsapp group saying oh i'm going out to qa hospital today so i'm going oh i can come with you oh brilliant we'll meet at 12 at the canteen and we'll go and do it together and it was uniting people that together on their own feel quite isolated and unable to make a difference and bringing them into a team where they feel empowered and actually anything that empowers people can only be a good thing brilliant brilliant and yes yeah, such, such a fantastic campaign um and, and next question is kind of you know what's next i mean it's it's brilliant that the pressure you've put on the union with your massive um well massive in the context vote to reject the offer means that they've called today a 48 hour strike starting from 8 p.m on the 30th of april um through may day till 8 p.m on the 2nd of may um but and there's going to be a reballot um because your your strike mandate's coming up to an end soon on the current ballot um but um two questions really what do you think needs to happen next like what what are your kind of demands what, what do you want to see happen and and what's your call to members across the trade union movement well i think what what needs to happen next so it's going to be a bit of a blurry picture because we've got, I think, is it 11 or 13 health unions cu- currently balloting? Obviously, Unison and RCN are two of those biggest. We've then got GMB and Unite, but we've got the Union of Radiographers. There's so many smaller unions and each of them carry a share of the vote. So it's going to be really interesting to see how those ballots unfold. And I hope they're inspired by the RCN ballot. Um, however, at the same time, the RCN has been very clear, regardless of what anyone else is doing, we have our mandate and our fight to do, and we really hope that that encourages other people. We've also got the BMA leading a really impressive campaign at the moment as well for pay restoration. So I think, you know, like you mentioned, we've got some horrific trade union laws in this country that I only learned very recently um, on a trip to, to Paris, where we were lucky enough to meet striking French workers who were explaining that two people within a workplace can decide to go on strike and that's all that's needed. You know, whereas we have these set periods, we have these ballot thresholds, they have to be postal ballots. So we do have to go through all that rigmarole again. Um, And that's why we're getting our strike in now, because legally we have to have two weeks notice. 
um, and we can fit that strike in before. And actually, we're picking up where we left off because before the government agreed to talk, we had announced that we were doing a 48 hour strike without derogation. So that's the next step. But I think after that, you know, the battle is really going to kind of pick up because what we need to do is get out there on the floor, keep this anger and frustration going and help to channel it and mobilise. I think the two things I'd like to see from the RCM perspective, I'd really like to see our membership grow, particularly with our healthcare assistants and nursing support workers. I've spoke to so many who go, oh, I can't join that, I'm not a nurse. And I think the RCM can be a bit clearer on its wording, because when we say nurse, we mean nursing family, and we include healthcare support workers and nursing assistants. And so many of them want to be part of this fight and actually have more so need because their pay is even more diabolical than everyone else's. So I really want to see that grow that membership grow and then we need to really get members actively involved and that means actively involved in ballots but also actually actively involved in their unions because we've seen i mean the bma is a really interesting example of going on strike having a difficult result and then rebuilding their union and i'm relatively new to the trade union side of things so i'm learning loads but i think the thing that seems clear to me is the most important aspect has to be the democratic element and it has to be member led so i think people who are on the floor workers, rank and file who have the experience of going on strike, the experience of being hard up, they need to put themselves forwards for positions within that union to be part of those, that decision making process, because the more removed from that you are, the more re removed you are from the reality and the sentiment of what's going on on the floor. So I, I, I think people, even in unions that did accept, I think get really involved in your union, don't leave the union because we are the unions, let's make them better by dedicating more of our time and energy to them and, and being part of that process. And, you know, kind of going back to what we said about this movement of frontline workers in their own time, we've made a huge difference. We've had a huge impact. We can have that impact within our unions. Um, so I think that that for me is the next step and, and what we need to do. Um, and I can't remember if that was both of your questions or if there was one that I missed. No, that's great. That's um, that's really, really great. I mean, um, I mean, what, I think you know one of the things you, you've said to me previously about this is like you know the rank this is this is entirely the rank and file this is the ground this is the gr a vote from the ground up led by people on the ground the rank and file and um and and it's kind of changed the dynamic I think you know the rank and file they're on the, they're on the front you're on the front foot that's why the RCN are making these decisions and kind of that I, surely you know it's um it's making stuff happen and it, and it kind of what do you think are the possibilities because where can you go from here and I guess you know you mentioned the junior doctors like would you you know would, wouldn't it be great I'd like to know what you think about you know if you and the junior doctors are on strike today mm -hmm. together um you know and the kind of coordination and coordination you know on the 2nd of May you'll the teachers will be striking um you know kind of how we what do you think about kind of possibilities about potentially bringing it all together and, and really taking on the government well i mean i'm i'm for it i mean in, when my local neu have had demonstrations they've invited me down to speak at their their pickets in their their marches and and vice versa they've been really supportive and i think actually yeah let's show solidarity because we're in similar positions we're public sector workers we are trying to provide public services for the for the benefit of the public and we're fighting against our own government who should be providing that, you know? So I think that that unity is really important and show solidarity and show this is part of a wider political struggle. And I use political in a looser term, not party political, because it transcends that. It's political in terms of the mechanisms of power. This is about us going, well, hang on, how come we've got the richest prime minister of all times with double the wealth of, of, the, of the own monarch? How come we've got all these elite minted i think is the only word individuals telling us oh it's not reasonable to ask for 15 percent when mps pay rises have risen above inflation when you know they're they're able to benefit from all these second jobs when they're lifting bankers bonuses and when they're throwing money out the window on ppe contracts and all these ludicrous things and i kind of made the decision to myself do you know what i'm not looking at, gonna let anyone tell me what is reasonable about my pay unless they're working in my role and in, in, in a part of that family because then they understand it you know we're not going to have people on such vast amounts of money such as the media who are very happy to quiz nurses and interrogate them over whether they think they earn enough and so well, hang on how much do you earn <laughs> you know do you want a job swap you can't because you're not trained you're not qualified to do what I do and I think that's kind of for me recognizing part of that bigger political struggle particularly when we're in a bit of a political vacuum you know Keir Starmer today said that he doesn't feel the BMA's 
35% request is, is reasonable. And you think, you're, you're the leader of the Labour movement. Like, you know, if we've got, we know the Tories are not on the side of working people or public sector, we need, and if opposition are failing to fill that, that voice, who does? And for me, politics is, all, is always about people on the ground and inspiring them, you know? We're supposed to live in representative democracy where our MPs represent our views. We know that's not how it works in practice, but this is kind of a similar question to that, how we work in politics, how we work in our unions. By working locally and collectively, we can enforce change on a bigger scale. And I think for me, that that's the key part of this, you know, the government initially said they would never talk about pay and we've got them to talk about pay. They initially said they wouldn't give us an offer. We've got them to give us an offer because ultimately it's their responsibility to provide these services. Um, I think it was interesting today in our meeting with the RCM, we did speak about the junior doctors and if we could coordinate with them. Um, there were kind of two viewpoints on that, which were both, were, well, yes, we can, but how do we do that? Is it more effective to go out on the same day or is it more effective to stagger so that say in a week, you might have two days of junior doctors off then following two days of nurses off. So it prolongs that. And I think it's really hard to have these conversations because on the one hand, you think who's in the hospital, you know, that's your gut instinct isn't it, as a healthcare worker. But then you remind yourself, well, hang on, who's there at the minute? <laughs> we, we don't have the staff and this is why we're doing it. And this is where I think the narrative comes into play because the media are very happy to try and demonize nurses and doctors, forgetting that nurses are the most trusted profession and doctors are the most respected. They try and demonize ordinary working people. You, you alluded to some of the smears earlier where a member of our campaign was told they don't represent working people, despite literally campaigning for working people. And I think it's, it's pointing out to the media that their irresponsibility saying this was a done deal before it was even done that's irresponsible and that's frustrating members who go we haven't had our say yet don't undermine that democratic process it's not your decision to make it's ours and and you know holding that to account a bit and and, and taking control of that public narrative because we are members of the public you know I was on radio this morning and she said to me you know, how do you feel about people's operations being cancelled? And I said, we're on waiting list. We're, I, one, a member of my family has had their operation cancelled four times. It was nothing to do with strikes. It was short staffing. That is the reality. And it's almost a bit like gaslighting where you've got media, politicians who are so far removed from this, telling you what's going on repeatedly. And you start thinking, that's just nonsense. That is not what's happening on the shop floor. I met my own MP recently who told me that he knows about nurses more than me, that he spends more time with nurses and has a better insight into nursing than me. I was like, mate, I'm literally a nurse, a volunteer with the Royal College of Nursing, the voice of nursing. How can you even say that or think that? It's just ludicrous and it's arrogant. And I think that's kind of the bloody nose that they're getting now of going, well, do you know what? Actually, we're gonna stand up for ourselves. And, and, and that empowerment of real working people, I hope has wider political consequences in the sense that it starts, I feel like something's awakening that we that has, that has been asleep. It's not absent in Britain, but it's been asleep. And I feel like after 12, 13 years of backbreaking austerity, of just the most duplicitous, corrupt government we've seen in a long, long time, people are starting to get fed up. And of this, these rags in the media just spouting whatever they want to, just ideologic rhetor rhetorical rants, that's all they are. They're not news. You know, it's, we, we've got people on talk shows that are just ideologues uh, talking about um, the NHS and how it's not. And it's like, you've got no idea. You're so far removed from it. Why are we not listening to people about it? Why are we not listening to the people who know what's going on? Because they live and breathe it. They see it on a day to day basis. And the fact that the government don't want to listen. And I, I always say to myself, when people are in crisis, the NHS is there for them. When the NHS is in crisis, why is the government not there for us? It's so obvious that they don't want to be. You know, there's so many government ministers that have their hands in the pockets of private healthcare agencies that make a mint out of the NHS. They profit out of short staffing, which means they profit out of our misery. And, you know, my plight isn't against nurses working agency. That's fine. If that's what they've got to do, they want to do. It's the companies that then make a mint off the top of that. And it's it's going, why is this allowed to go on? Why is there 500 excess deaths every week in the NHS and the government aren't talking about that? there's we're failing to hit staffing targets every single day and the government aren't talking about that but the second workers start standing up for themselves they find these issues really important and I think it's being able to see through that narrative and uh, ironically I know we use social media a lot but also break out of that kind of headline short tweet narrative and have these sorts of conversations where you can actually look at the nuance look at look in a bit more context because nothing's ever that black or white um yeah sorry that was a little bit of a, a rant no, that's great. That's great. And, and and it is 
you know, the, the mem like you were saying that the members have made this decision in tens, numbers of tens of thousands. Mm -hmm. um, it is so inspiring and I'm sure it's gonna give every worker who is seeking pay justice and, and fighting um, confidence to carry on. So, I mean, thanks so much, Harry. Um, been great to talk to you particularly on this um exciting day and solidarity um thank you for all the support and thank you for, for for having the time to have this chat and i'm very much looking forward to seeing you in june i believe what's the yeah, date june, june the 10th june the 10th for the rank and file conference i think that's really cool i think for people like myself who are quite new to trade unionism or who are discovering it and realizing the influence it can have being an ordinary member and that feeling empowerment, I think to have opportunities to learn more about that, share that and develop that, I think is exactly what we need because we've got these systems that are growing um, and it's, it's helping us all work together, share our experiences, share our learning to make that more effective. And I know NHS workers are kind of supporting that as well. And um, NHS workers say no, sorry. And I think it's just going to be awesome. I'm really looking forward to it. Brilliant, brilliant. Good place. <laughs> I'll see you on the picket line. Yes, awesome. Fantastic, thanks Harry. Thank you very much.